there was only a few choices. If the world was couture at that time, it would either be Paris or London. Um, and I've always wanted to make a film in London. I've always wanted to, the opportunity to work with with uh, English actors on, on their home turf. Um, and Paris was maybe it had been you know we've seen some Paris couture things, and I don't speak French. So that takes that off. And, then, so, and um, learning more about the world just sort of lent itself. It was nice to see Daniel play English. And what was it that made you want to set a story in the, in the world of couture? Is, is Reynolds Woodcock based on anyone in particular? Not one person in particular. He's a kind of combination of a few different people. Cristobal Valenciaga is the first. He's, sort of, he's actually fast, um, but ended up in Paris. Um, of that era, you have the, the Norman Hartnell, and that's a great English designer, dress royalty. And the list goes on. Once you start investigating one, you find others. And I didn't know that much about it at all. So you start discovering people that you've never heard of who have made amazing clothes that um, aren't the most popular things that maybe you've seen, but, but amazing nonetheless. But they all kind of share a similar kind of preoccupation with their work um, at the expense of, you know. Uh, any kind of normal life. Um, so, yeah. And Leslie, for you, the, the character of Cyril, did she have any basis in reality? Is there anyone in particular that you sort of modeled her on? Uh, no, not really. But, I mean, what was very um, difficult, um, well, still now, but more so that most of the, um, the, the male designers that were working at that level they had a family member who worked very close with them. Um, and it was you know, it could be a mother or sister. And that was and certainly Balenciaga. That was his situation. As well. so, but I mean, no, I mean, um, Versace who worked with his sister for a long time. Um, so I suppose the, the thing was to um, for, for Daniel and I to um, get these two siblings together who knew each other inside out. You know, spent a lifetime together and uh, worked very closely and kind of um, couldn't function really without each other. Very, very, very codependent siblings. Um, but no, I mean in the same way that you know, the character in Woodcock is, uh, Reynolds isn't based on anyone in particular, neither is Cyril, but um, I was very glad that Paul decided to give me a man's name because it was something to kickstart. <laughs> Vicky, <laughs> okay, uh, first things first, who in fact wins a staring contest between you and Daniel Day Lewis? I do. <laughs> and uh, tell me a little bit for you about the basis of, of Alma. What, where does she fit into the dynamic between Cyril and Rem? Where does she fit in? For you, like, what, how does she fit in between the two of them? Um, I don't think she fits in anything. <laughs> I think that's really how she fits in, because she doesn't fit in. And, Paul, can you talk a little bit about that, about seeing Alma as this kind of disruptor in their world, and the extent to which that is sort of a, a, a positive or a needed thing? Um, well, yeah, it's great to have, like... Um, um, a disruptor, but it's, it's love, and so if, is it a disruptor? I don't know. I mean, it's sort of needed to have, um, he has that nice line, a house that doesn't change is a dead house, so it seems like that this house may be just kind of nearing its death faster than it should be without something new to come in and kind of uh, make it grow again or make it, make it come alive. And, um, almost thrust into a situation where no one is showing her the road. Um, and so she's got to improvise and, and make it up as she goes along um, and, and open people's eyes, I suppose. Strangle them if she has to. to sort of seeing what is right in front of their face, um, which is something great. And so Vicky, what, what is it that keeps Alma there? What is her connection, do you think, to, to Reynolds? I think that they are both um, very different in a way, but because they're so different, I think this is why they also love each other. So he comes from a very different world, she comes from a different world, and he shows her 
a new world she would never have access to. So we don't know where she comes from. She's obviously not from the city, or she's not rich, or she's not part of this society. And he shows her this whole world of dressmaking and, and all this glamour and beauty. And she, I think, shows him an inner world. She takes him to an inner world. So both of them can give the other a very different approach to the world. And, again, yeah. and Leslie, what for you is sort of Cyril's relationship with Alma, that dynamic between them, it's as if Cyril knows that she, they need Alma, but then obviously he's trying to sort of manage how she sort of fits within the, the bigger picture of the world. What, what, what for you is the relationship there? Well, I mean, I think, I, I mean, Alma's arrival is sort of bittersweet because she's, Cyril's seen women come and go. She's, she's in a kind of maternal way, had to mop up the mess of Reynolds' uh, emotional life. Um, and then at first, you know, Alma's just, an, uh, she's just another woman, but as Cyril says in the film, you know, she, becomes, she becomes fond of her, and, and she can see that, um, that, that, that Alma is presenting to Reynolds a, 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 a challenge, an emotional challenge, and that I suspect that Cyril thinks somewhere down the line that, you know, it's about time he did have somebody in his life that was had gravitas and that somebody he could have something real with as opposed to a lot of his other relationships which have um, had obviously other benefits but um, not necessarily challenged him emotionally. But it's, it's a complex one. He's, Cyril's remained single all her life, never married. Um, and uh, if you get somebody coming into the middle of um, two people like that, or even albeit that their brother and sister, um, that, that dynamic has to be negotiated. And I think that, um, that, you know, Alma obviously is, is, as you can see, she is the greatest challenge for Reynolds. She makes him, absolutely forces him to look, to look at himself and review what he's like as a human being. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a film about the human condition, isn't it? How we all respond and deal with love or lack of love and um, people that challenge us in our lives. And, Paul, for you, I'm running just the sort of genesis of this story overall. In, in creating the character of Reynolds Woodcock, at what point when you were writing the film did you know that you wanted Daniel to play the part? Um, well, even before I was writing it, I had hoped that we would work together again. Uh, we talked about it, um, and like anything, sort of um, trying to look for a good idea. Um, and then there was an idea that I had here about a man and a woman, and then that man and a woman became the triangle of that relationship had the man and a sister. And so we. I told him a little bit about the story that I was cooking up, and, and we agreed that I would share the writing with him as I went along, um, because it also required investigating this world, this culture. So we, we did research together. He would do researching, and I would be researching, but I would be doing more writing. And I would go to him, uh, you know, every couple weeks or every 10, 15, 20, 30 pages, and, and share things with him. And, and um, um, because I speak, I don't speak English, I speak American. He could help me <laughs> with that as it was going along. Um, so it was a real collaboration in that way. Um, so it, it's, it, obviously everybody wants to work with Daniel, and I, was, I just, I got to, to kind of nudged to the front of the line because we've done it before. And we sort of hoped that, um, yeah. But, uh, was the collaborative aspect of working on this project different from the way the two of you worked together on There Will Be Blood? A little bit, only that I had a lot more of There Will Be Blood already by the time I went to him. Um, but it, it, it took about the same amount of time, a couple of years of research and writing, and then about a year of, of shooting and editing. So that time frame was about the same, but you know, it was the second time around, so it was different. So the first time sort of figuring out how to get to work with each other and exactly what he might need or how he wants to do it. And um, so, yeah, uh, boring answer is it was the same but different, you know, um, as, as it would be. And Vicky, Leslie, knowing the amount of preparation that Daniel is known to put into his work, 
does that change your process at all? Does it change the way that you prepare for your roles here? Uh, no, because you, you, you can't adopt somebody else's working method. You, uh, you have to do what you do and what suits you, otherwise I'm going to be just constantly looking at somebody else trying to emulate them, and that wouldn't work at all. Um, so no, I mean, yeah. I did my thing and he did his and he did hers. <laughs> I think what was maybe different is usually I would rehearse maybe before or do some reading or something. And because of his way of working, or because it's what he was proposing as a, you know, how we should work, we didn't rehearse. So we only, we really met kind of for the first time um, on set and in costume. So I couldn't see him before or rehearse. Or, so that was, was different from normally. And Paul, can you talk a little bit about that? How, like how did you sort of adopt even production to, to Daniel's process? Um, well, it's it's all just built together, you know. I mean, um, this is the the funny thing here was that um, everything in the house of Woodcock was so particular in terms of what chair, what silverware, what teacup, what you know. So you have to involve Daniel in every aspect of that, as you would want to, um, because playing that character and living in that bedroom, I mean, there's not, there's, there isn't a piece of, of furniture or a uh, wall covering that hasn't been, you know, approved, thought costume. about, talk about, certainly costume, you know, you have to, Mark is, is working, it wasn't as if Mark uh, bridges our costumes on, could go away independently, create a bunch of costumes and put them into Reynolds with Reynolds lap, you know, it was, a, it was very much a collaboration, because the whole, everything from this world is kind of coming from Reynolds. Um, and that's as it should be, you know. Um, it was this sort of collaboration to get very, very early on. So the production was pushed forward by that. You always try to do things like shoot in order and that kind of stuff, but then it wasn't, it was not particularly fussy about that. I think everybody would have to try to shoot in order. So we were able to sort of try to do that, but within reason. It was, that always ends up being impossible. And I want to be sure to ask specifically about the scene where uh, Reynolds takes Alma's measurements. Simply because I'm struggling to recall a seduction scene based on putting clothes on, not taking clothes off. And the way in which so much of the dynamic between the three of them gets established in, in that very scene. And is that kind of what it meant for you and why? What was the importance of that scene for you? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you said it nicely, um, to how to have a sex scene without sex, you know, which is, 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 would be a goal, you know, back in the old days, you know, and then you know, people didn't take their clothes off in movies, and I'm perfectly happy not seeing them take their clothes off. You, know, you can get just as much romanticism or enjoyment out of that. And this uh, presented itself as like, you know, I mean, clothes making, can't put, filming, can be, filming can be pretty boring, but the idea of filming measurements, you just, you kind of have to draw it out and hope that it can be cinematic and there's this intimacy between them and then what happens when we throw a third party into it, you know, um, who's probably seen it before. Um, yeah, you kind of hope that it can act as the, yes, a seduction scene and a sex scene without doing any of that. But it's also interesting seeing other people, like, I, I, you know, seeing other people's work. That, um, I like that. Um, the the obsession, the details and measurements is something I, I don't think I'd ever seen it in a movie before. So it's not really, it's, that's that's always a good thing. Um, and I will, yeah, it's nice to, to when you can appreciate other the, the, the detail work that happens in other people's work. And Vicky, can you talk a little about about that scene? Um, maybe, maybe again, is that sort of where Alma is being seduced into this world, but then obviously surprised a little bit by by what she finds there. Yes. Um, what should I say about the scene? I think you see everything on my face. <laughs> but I could say now, but it was exactly how you see it in the movie. That's how it was for me. And uh, I think we had, it was not so easy to do because we were thinking of where does she take a close off, you know, back you know, in the 50s, it was not just, yeah, poof. So this was something we had to change because I, from, from my side, I was more easy with this. But then we realized, oh no, this is actually 
completely wrong, that you wouldn't take the clothes off. So then I, I went and hid behind the screen and so on. Um, so that was interesting to see, to do it twice. Once, you know, closer to me, and then one really more thinking about time and how it was then, and, you know, what, what distance you would try and keep between them. Because I think now we are so easy to, you know, ah, <laughs> I like you, and I think we touched it, especially here. <laughs> Please I give you a hug at the reception just because they <laughs> like you. We're hugged. <laughs> we shot the scene twice. As, uh, yeah. Because the first time it wasn't very good. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was a ghost in the attack. I remember saying to Paul, because it was the first scene I shot, and, and uh, we shot it for quite a few days. And, uh, and then a few days later I said to Paul, God, it's really annoying because you know what it's like when you first shoot a scene. You first start, you always think, I wish I could do my first day again. Um, just because you're not quite, you know, you, you, you may be, it may look great, but you just don't quite feel you're in it. And, uh, and then we said, oh, well, you're going to get your big wish. <laughs> we are going to do it again. <laughs> we actually, then a lot of it changed, didn't it? The room changed, uh, and then my costume changed. Your, the dress you wore, <coughs> having fitted changed. But um, it's nice to have that freedom to say, okay, we'll do this and something's not right, and you just go and do it again. I mean, such a luxury. I know, Paula, given that Reynolds Woodcock is, you know, he's making these sort of personal artistic pieces in an industry that largely is sort of technical and commercial, how personal is he for you? Like, how much of, of, of you is in Reynolds Woodcock? Well, none. I mean, I, I, I'm a movie director. I don't know anything about control. Obsession. <laughs> I'm a fucking movie director. Do you remember how once you said to me, once you said I asked you something and then probably I was very tired because we were working a lot and so on, and then you said, well, well you know, I have one, and you quoted Reynolds. Is it still in the movie? I want everything and then more? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> you actually quoted it anyway. By accident? No. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, it's very e it was very easy to um, write a lot of the, the, that, the kind of stuff, that kind of um, you know, obsession with, with your work. Um, but then, you know, hopefully, but my, my family might say differently, you have to stretch yourself a little bit and try to create that dynamic that's more dramatic. Um, but yeah. Well, the, the, the question also comes up for myself, having just watched the movie, to what extent do you think of this as a romance? Like, is that sort of the core of the story, the, the romantic story between Reynolds and Paul? I do. Um, I don't know what else it would be um, uh, besides that. Um, it, it was it was always my intention to make a romantic film. Um, you know, the kind of things that we talked about and that you think about instantly are the classic Gothic romances, you know, of, of the old days. Whether it's whether you're Rebecca, Gaslight, Vertigo, those kinds of things. But you know, you, you really you, you you remember them and you idolize them, but you quickly try to forget them because trying to get on a path and do one of those is like a recipe for disaster. You just like pretend they don't exist. But usually, those are um, I like the the romance of those films. Um, if, if you look at Vertigo, you know it's, it's really about obsession and, and that kind of um, fever that can come over you. Um, when, when romance comes your way, you know, um, it's not all just montages of trying on dresses. It's, it's maybe a montage or two, but it's really, it, it, gets, it gets pretty complicated and peculiar, as love does. And tell me a little bit just about the, the clothes of the movie. You mentioned the, your costume designer, Mark Bridges, and w w this movie in particular, I would imagine, will present a lot of very specific challenges for him. What was it like in actually creating the designs of the House of Workout? Uh It was good. It was complicated. You know, we didn't want to have a character that was, you know, 
capital letters, the greatest designer of all time. He had to kind of fit within that world, be really, really good, uh, but run his own race. You know, um, we obviously there's great dresses of the period that we we drew inspiration from, but there were some dresses that were just sort of built from the ground up uh, by Mark. That sort of sketches and ideas that he had. One of my favorites is a great dress that he does when Alma's at the fashion show that's clearly him inspired, Reynolds inspired by Alma's waitress outfit, you know, that he sort of took and made as a, as a as sort of a waitress outfit, as a couture dress. So thinking, thinking along those lines, that, that's what Mark does so well, um, coming up with things like that, that you, you, you just can't come up, I can't come up with that kind of stuff in a script or alone in your room, you just, you know that there's got to be a lot of dresses and um, we had an amazing, we had our, re our own real life atelier right there. It was like, you know, kind of for us to work in and play in and, and, and to pick fabrics and to pick laces and all that kind of stuff. Um, we were, the kind of life of the film and the life of that atelier were very interchangeable. A lot of those women would, would kind of come over from the production office where we were building that stuff and be in the film, it's particularly when we needed close up work. So they, you know, because they're so good at it, so good at it working with that stuff, that, and we would put them in their white lab coats and, and film them. Um, so that was kind of a, a terrific part of the experience for all of us, was getting to know those, those folks and working with them. Um, I, could, I mean, I could, I could hijack the conversation with talk about the dresses, but so it's a it's <laughs> long. Well, maybe it's a, a silly way to put it, but Vicky Leslie, what are those dresses like? Like, are they in fact, do they feel special when you put them on? <laughs> the, first of all, they were all made, you know, for the movie, so they were all made to my size, so I had many, many fittings, and all the dresses were made as we were going along. So some of the dresses were only made, I don't know, we were already over half, or sometimes, yeah. or sometimes the night before, or, you know, and then I would also give my opinion, and then I would go to Reynolds and ask Reynolds' opinion, and I would go back to Mark and say, he said yes. <laughs> you know, like this. So it was very special to wear. And you feel very different, of course, if you wear a dress like this. And, uh, yes, I, it's, a, it's a dream for, for a girl. I think I almost had more costume fittings than filming days. <laughs> She's not joking. <laughs> Um, there, there was a th great thing about Balenciaga, I don't, we, didn't, we didn't get this good, but there was a great thing that I learned in researching it, that Balenciaga's dresses he was able to make, um, they were so perfectly constructed that sometimes it would just come, it would narrow down to one latch that a woman had to put on and it fit perfectly, or they would have this sort of, it's kind of very romantic, romantic looking back, they would say, you know, that a, a, a suit that he could make to fit you could fit you, 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 and you. That's how good it was. But but you got the point that the construction of the dresses in these Balenciagas was so immaculate, so perfect from the inside, that there was actually very little to do putting it on where they were talking about as opposed to other designers. You know, you needed like a forklift to get somebody in it, and you needed three women to tie it all up. And those are the kinds of things that I had no idea about, but that every other designer would look at Balenciaga in awe just at how simple and complicated at the same exact time these creations were. When everybody else, sort of behind the scenes, underneath the dress, it looked like a train wreck, you know. But, but Balenciaga famously didn't draw, did he? He, 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 he would get fabric and he would sculpt it on, on the woman so he could play with the fabric, which is, when you know that and then you see some of his uh, photographs of his um, designs, you can, you can see that because the, the fabric is the is a, a absolute star and it has this kind of structure and life because he didn't really draw so he just he just played the fabric on, on, on women. And now Paul to maybe ask you a question about the production of the movie in the limited amount of uh, information that's been out about the movie, one of the things people were saying was that you were going to be acting as a cinematographer on the film. There actually is no cinematography credit on the movie. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how you worked on this film and like why you decided to work in maybe a different way? Well, yeah, we, I worked with, um, I've done a bunch of, um, well, when we're working with Robert Elson, who I normally work with, there's a group of guys, Greg Gaffney, Mike Baum, and Jeff Kunkel, Grip, and Colin Anderson, Eric Brown, and 
Um, what I, we do some smaller projects, not features, like um, great projects with the Heim girls that we did, and I would work with that crew. And we just really liked working together, and Robert was unavailable, and it seemed like an opportunity. We sort of looked at each other and said, I think we can do this, you know. Um, but I wouldn't uh, dare call myself a cinematographer, I should, you know, with, with, with the collaboration of those fellows. Uh, it was a really a great situation. We love working together, and um, um, yeah, I just want to point out there's some gentleman Jim Clement is is here, who's also the, one of the best gaffers in the history of Hollywood. <laughs> Taught me a lot to do. So in front of him, I would not call myself a cinematographer. <laughs> but did working in this way loosen up the production somehow? Did it, do you think it had some impact on how you were able to make the movie? No, I don't think so. I think we were all just sort of trying to do, it's the same thing of going to work every day. You want to try and get something good, and when you do, you get excited and confident, and when you don't, you get bummed out, and you try and go back the next day. But no, it was really um, a tight group of guys who worked together. So. It was different for me. Really? How so? Yeah. Because if you are the same person looking through the camera, and the same person as the director, then you're two and one, and then I, you know, I can feel, anyway I can sometimes feel if you like what I do or not, but then I can feel even more because you become one with the camera. Right. The camera is like, like a living eye, but it's also a machine, so it's a strange mix, and then if you add the eye of the director in it, it becomes like this super eye. <laughs> But it's actually nice. It's actually nice. When you were doing the camera, it felt like, I don't know, I liked it. It was, it was very loving in a way, but the way that you were looking then, because maybe because you had a director, I don't know. But for me, it was different. And uh, we have a few minutes for some questions from the audience, but before we do, I'm just going to ask one more question, which is simply if the rumors are true, and this is the final performance by Mr. Daniel Day-Lewis. I'm wondering for the three of you how it feels to have been a part of that. Well, bittersweet. I mean, I, I would hope that he would reconsider. <laughs> I hope he does. But if this is it, I'm very happy to be very, very happy and thrilled. Sure. The last scene we shot is that was the um, one of the last sequences of the film, which is the, in the park with the pram, um, and that we were wrapped after that. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, I mean, uh, who knows? Who knows? Reverse his decision, but I'm glad to have got snuck one in with him <laughs> before, before he closed the town. <laughs> quite good, actually, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and we have just a couple minutes for anybody? Oh, yeah, towards the middle there. Um, the music is so integral to the film. I'm curious if you have any idea when you were actually filming, do you have any music on set? Because I can't imagine watching this without that score. And the question has to do with the, the music in the film, and, and maybe at what point in the process do you start working with your composer? The music was created while we were writing the script by Johnny Greenwood, who I've collaborated with before. Um, and so he was able to read the script and have the research books that Daniel and I were working with as well. And, then, and slowly he would come up with piano demos and send things to me, and the things that seemed to work, I would, I would, I would star. And um, then he would see dailies. And he came to the set a few times, so it was a, 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 was not a kind of classic make a movie, hand it over, get some music back. It was really um, woven together from even before shooting started, which was really, really helpful for me. And I was able to give that music to Vicky and to Daniel. You didn't get any, I think I forgot about you. No, I didn't get any. <laughs> <laughs> not working with you again. <laughs> Sarah was in her own world. So. And anyone else? No, right there. Um, in some of your films, sometimes you use inspiration from a movie from the past. Um, for this film, did you perhaps jump into something made by Kubrick or any other director that you love? And the question has to do with whether there were any past films that, that you, you use as a, as a reference here. 
Well, I mentioned Rebecca, you know, um, and I, you know, um, uh, you, you, you be really careful if you say that and you say Hitchcock's name, because I know we didn't want to do a Hitchcock movie like a Brian De Palma number or something like that. It was more that feeling um, of those gothic romances, which I knew pretty well and discovered a few that I had never, like, the constant nymph is a really strange one. I have a particular Joan Fontaine obsession. She's <laughs> like, like, she really does it for me. <laughs> so, the constant nymph is one, and obviously anything else with suspicion is another one um, with Joan. So anything with Joan was good. And, you know, Olivia, and I like her. But, um, and Kubrick, I mean, you, I don't think anybody of my generation makes a movie and doesn't sort of scratch their head and think, wow, well, we'll never do it as good. So just, just. <laughs> but, um, but, but it was more the kind of old, that those sort of old masters, Joe, Joe Mankiewicz, even just thinking about uh, All About Eve, you know, which we did a different thing altogether. But um, those kind, those guys, you know, this, this sort of 40s and 50s guys, those, those are my favorites. The kind of guys that you see on TCM every day. <laughs> and we have time for one more, I think. Oh, yeah, back there. Um, uh, I, well, I want to approach this respectfully. Obviously, I'm a huge fan. Um, but I'm curious to pick your brain about, as a seasoned director, when you finish a movie, are you able to say that, yes, this will be received well by audiences and by critics, or the more the type of thing where you, what's most important to you is telling this story and the reception is kind of irrelevant. And the question is, when you, when you finish a movie, are you concerned at all with how it's uh, received by audiences? Well, the butterflies in my stomach today and yesterday <laughs> tell me that I do care a lot. <laughs> Mouth is dry, my heart is deep. He wouldn't even have a glass of wine at lunchtime. So he know he's got to keep his head level. So. But after we're done, we can. <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, I mean, I, I got to sit in the back and watch the back of everybody's head, and it's really an exciting thing to see a crowded theater um, look at something that you've just made over the past year. It's really overwhelming and thrilling. And hearing you guys laugh and hearing you applaud is like um, pretty exciting, I have to say. Um, I'm looking forward to the seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. You know, because you can you can an anticipate. I think ultimately you probably think you convince yourself foolishly that everyone will love this and this is great. But you know, you have done it enough, and you know that that isn't the case. That's, that's not how things work. You know, certain people love it, certain people don't. Um, sometimes more than others, and you just sort of start to kind of roll with that, and really and hope. I really do hope for this one that everybody enjoys it or, or gets something out of it. I hope everybody goes, you know, to the theater to see it. That's I really think is that in this day and age you sort of work so hard on something, and I'm I'm of a generation that came to the movie theater and saw things. I still sound like an old man now, but that, that is something that you do, you, you hope for. Um, it's a thrilling feeling to see this theater packed like this, and, and, and after that, is, it's not up to me. So, thank you for that.